It's my favourite time of the week because it is of course time to build a brand new gaming PC build. In this one, I'll be showing you how to build an awesome system for 1080p and 1440p gaming for well under $1,200. I'll be walking you guys through all the parts I picked and why, alongside some alternative choices if you want to mix things up a bit, showing you how to build it from start right through to finish and looking at performance later. Testing everything from Apex, Fortnite and Call of Duty. So let's dive into it after a quick word from today's video sponsor. Newegg's wide range of PC hardware offers you great choice with a range of tools to make your life that bit easier. The PC Builder tool, for example, allows you to build and configure a custom PC with ease. Simply select your preferred parts and let the tool do the rest. There's even an AI builder that can recommend a custom PC based on your specifications. Looking at a Primo or laptop solution instead, Newegg's laptop and gaming PC finder allows you to find the right laptop or gaming PC for your budget and the games you want to play. Check it out at the first link in the description below. When I say that this build provides awesome price to performance metrics, I really believe that and the CPU and GPU combo are absolutely integral to making that happen. Now for the graphics card, I've picked up the Radeon RX 7700 XT. Now when this card first launched, it wasn't great value for money. Instead, you would have been better buying the $50 more expensive 7800 XT. But I think that AMD have realized this and realized it quite quickly, dropping the the price of this card down now in some instances to under $400. This costs $399 on Newegg at the time of filming. And when it comes to its NVIDIA competition, it now frankly wipes the floor. The 4060 Ti is the closest you're going to get on a price point basis from NVIDIA. Now this might give you slightly better ray tracing, you get DLSS3 which I prefer to AMD frame gen. However, as far as raw performance goes, the 7700 XT wipes the floor with both. Now you get 12 gigabytes of video memory, which is 4 gigabytes more than what you'll find on the RTX 4060 Ti. With price to performance metrics that in my testing outpaced this against pretty much all of the other cards at this price point. It's amazing for 1080p gaming. You're talking kind of overkill really, ultra settings and everything to the point where frame rates are so high you could drop down and get something arguably a bit cheaper. But 1440p for me is where this card is really at home. This Gigabyte Gaming OC card is also a really nice incarnation of the 7700 XT. Previously we've reviewed and been pretty impressed with Sapphire's Pulse design as well. Just go for whichever 7700 XT is best value for money at the point in which you go to build this gaming PC. Now that you can see here, it's quite an imposing card. You've got a triple fan cooler. You get two 8-pin power connectors at the top, so no need to worry about PCI Gen 5. You get this really nice backplate on the card, which I think looks absolutely fantastic, with two HDMIs and two DisplayPort connections, with this quite large three-fan cooler, whereby the middle fan blade spins in the opposite direction to help aid airflow and air pressure. Now, in terms of pairing this graphics card up with a good CPU, the decision wasn't really too hard for this build. Obviously, it's kind of cool to stick with an AMD CPU and an AMD GPU, hashtag Team Red, but it needs to be the right decision for the build and it needs to be the one that provides the best value for money and the best performance. Now thankfully AMD seem to be ticking a lot of those boxes at the moment with both their 7600 and 7600X. Now depending on the price difference between these chips determines which one you'll want to go for. I've picked up the 7600 but I think now that the 7600X is only about $10 more on Newegg at the time of filming that might be the better buy. You get the same number of cores and same number of threads on both with the same relative power consumption but you're going to find high higher clock speeds on the X over the non-X variant. As far as whether you need to step up to something like a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9 chip, there is no need for a gaming build. Video editing, rendering, pop that CPU up as you may want the extra cores and extra power that a higher end chip particularly is going to deliver. The other reason that Ryzen makes so much sense is this. Now, not this particular motherboard, but this socket, the LGA 1700 socket. This socket is kind of at the end of its life, meaning no more Intel processors are gonna leverage it. AMD, on the other hand, with the B650 motherboards, this socket is going to be good for at least the next gen of Ryzen 9000 CPUs and maybe even beyond, meaning this build has a few more upgrade options than an Intel based system. And on top of that, the Intel CPUs are currently a bit more expensive at this price point and it's kind of a no brainer. In terms of the other parts I'll be installing into the motherboard, kept it nice and simple for this build. Let's start with the RAM, got 32 gigabytes of T-Force Delta 
RGB DDR5. RAM is easy. For gaming, you need 32 gigs. 16 just isn't enough anymore. And you want to go for a low latency kit with a speed of around about 6,000 mega transfers per second. This kit fits that bill really nicely and isn't going to break the bank. In fact, comes in at 6,400 megahertz, giving us extra power. Yeah, 400 more megahertz. In terms of storage, I've gone, I've been a bit boring. I go for this drive so often. Crucial P3 Plus, it's so good. So you're going to get read and write speeds in the region of about five gigabytes a second. It's a more entry level Gen 4 drive, but it's still rapid compared to some of the SSDs we've seen over the last few years. Now, I realized that I didn't really talk about the motherboard particularly very much. This is Gigabyte's B650 Gaming X AX. And again, it's a bit of a personal favorite of mine. It ticks a lot of boxes at this price point. Let me show you exactly what I mean. One of the big selling points is of course that AM5 socket in the middle, but you also get four RAM DIMMs for up to about 128 gigs of DDR5 memory. Down here, we've got plenty of room for M.2 SSDs with one main slot and then two secondary slots. There isn't any Gem 5 on there. Personally, I find that kind of disappointing. It would have been nice to see from a future proofing point of view. Thankfully, the IO does redeem things somewhat with a two and a half gig ethernet, plenty of high speed USBs and a type C 10 gigabit port there with of course the inclusion of Wi-Fi 6 as standard too. I would highly suggest picking up the AX version of this board to be honest with you as picking up an aftermarket third party Wi-Fi dongle can get expensive and they're often not that good. As far as installing the CPU goes, we first need to find this triangle here. Now this is the alignment triangle we'll be using to match up with the processor. For reference, we need to match it up with this triangle in the corner of the processor itself. All that there remains is to push the arm down, lift the socket cover upwards, and use the alignment triangle to drop the CPU into place. Add the socket cover back down, arm secures, and that's all there is to it. Now don't go ahead and throw this away if you may need it if you ever decide to RMA your motherboard, send it back or sell it on for any reason. Then it's time to install the RAM or the memory. Having gone for two DIMMs, it of course gives you upgrades later as well. You can just pick up an identical kit to scale up to 64 gigs of memory. And these will go in the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots of the motherboard. A little something like so. Get it lined up, push it in, get that nice satisfying click sound. And that really is all there is to it. RAM is one of the easier components to install and you can see there where you've got those two extra DIMM slots for any future upgrades you may want to consider. The M.2 drive is next, going to be using the top slot for our P3 Plus in this build. As I say, a genuinely bit of a shame this isn't a Gen 5 board. The B650 E boards have Gen 5 on both graphics and SSD, but a lot of the B650 non E boards do have it for the NVMe only. And as I say, it would have been nice to see. I'm not going to hold a grudge about it though. These things happen. It's about saving money. It's about being a bit cost efficient. And naturally that does mean a level of sacrifice. Super easy to get this thing installed, pop that heatsink back on and then use a teeny tiny screwdriver the standard Phillips head is going to be far too big to finish the M.2 installation off. And then all that remains is to pop the CPU cooler on. And this is where I've got to come clean. The cooler I wanted to use for this build, insert cooler here, is on the way, but it hasn't arrived yet. Although it gives me a great opportunity to actually tell you about the two different options I would recommend. The first of those options is this, and this is the AMD Ryzen stock cooler. You get it included with selected Ryzen processors of which the 7600 and 7600X are included and it does genuinely a pretty good job of keeping the chip cool. The major advantage with this is that it's not going to cost you any money. The major disadvantage is naturally going to be quite a lot louder than an aftermarket solution. The second option, which I'll be upgrading this build with later once it arrives, is to get a dedicated air tower cooler. I've picked up this Deepcool AG400, which I picked up for like £25 here in the UK, but in the US you can get it for like $26, $27. Unbelievable, one of the best value options right now. It's got a much larger heatsink, much larger larger fan and gives you more cooling capacity with less noise. However, it's all about personal preference and how much you're really trying to drive home maximum value for money when it comes to that price to performance calculation. Now this will normally come with pre-applied thermal paste, but I've used this one before. So a fresh dab of thermal paste and it screws directly in the four threads on the motherboard around the CPU. It's nice and easy. Take your time, tighten them up corner by corner just to avoid one being further in than any of the others. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about CPU coolers. I'll leave links to these and everything else mentioned today and the affiliate links in the description below. With all of that done, the motherboard is ready to be moved over into the case. Now, the case is an interesting one and I'm hoping by the end of this video that I'll be able to comfortably recommend it. But as of yet, I have not built it, nor really seen many reviews. I just saw it online and thought, yes, I'll have one of those. It's Fractal Design's new, I forgot what it's called. <laughs> What's it called? It's their new cheap case. I know that much. Ah, yes, it's the Fractal Design Focus 2. And the reason I bought it is that you probably recognize this. The original Fractal Design Focus G. It was a 
massively famous case, still one of the best selling on Newegg history for PC cases. And I'm hoping that this is gonna be the better, more up-to-date version. Now, it is a full-size ATX case, and it is a little bit basic, I'm not gonna lie. Now, it doesn't have a power supply shield, so it loses points in that regard. What it does have on the panel here is you've got like a little bit of a black deflection strip, which I guess aims to hide at least the front of the power supply, when you combine it especially with the fact the glass doesn't go all the way to the bottom. One thing this case does have is two included ARGB fans at the front, although you can now see those fans, and you can see they're really quite nice. They're both 140 mil, that's really good, over 120, it means they can run a bit slower while delivering the same air throughput and being quieter. You don't get any exhaust fans, which is a little bit of a shame, but you do get plenty of mounting for motherboards, drives, all of that kind of stuff. And you get that traditional fractal design top tier build quality. The main motivator for this case though, is that it's a bit of a contender, I'd say, for the Montec Air 100, one of the more budget oriented cases I've been using recently. And let's face it, the more money that we don't spend on the case, the more money that we can spend on the GPU. And that is what's gonna deliver those real life performance upgrades. When I said that this build was about raw gaming performance, I was f***ing about. Ow! Before installing the motherboard, there are a few things to check. And the first is the standoff locations on the motherboard tray. These stop the board from grounding out against the metal of the case. And you can see here, we've got three along the top, starting on the left, working all the way to the right, a further three along the middle. And you can actually see the center standoff is raised to hold the motherboard into place with three final ones down the bottom to cure the board in. You then need to check these line up with the motherboard. So three along the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom before going ahead, dropping the motherboard in and screwing it into place. As I say, really, really double check all those standoffs line up as you don't want to ground your board out against the metal on the case. There's always something quite special about installing the motherboard into the case. It's the point where the build feels like it's really starting to come together. And this is where having a motherboard that's a little bit too small for the case, this one's perfectly sized, can look a bit silly as well. So lots of people message me at this stage and go, James, I think I've got the wrong size motherboard. So try and stick if you can with a full size ATX motherboard in a full size ATX case. Not always possible, but generally speaking, the best way to go about things. After that, it is GPU time. Now, this is where things get really exciting. You can see here our lovely 7700 XT, which is gonna be a nice size as well for the case. Now, in this build, I'll be using the top PCI slot. Now, we're gonna line the graphics card up over this just to see which of the rear PCI lane covers need removing. In this build, it looks to be the second and third. So give these an unscrew, push the notch back on the end of the PCI slot, and click the graphics card into place. I'm gonna give it power via its two 8-pin power cables in the next stage, which is the PSU cables and wiring. All that then remains is the PSU. Now, I'm gonna give you some weird advice. Don't buy this one, buy the 850 version, as at the moment, for I don't know what reason, the 851 is $10 cheaper. Now, it might not stay that way forever. I'll link both options below for Newegg and Amazon. However, this is Thermaltake Smart BM3, and to my knowledge, it's the cheapest, reliable ATX3 PCI Gen 5 power supply at this price bracket. All of the other ATX3 options are currently quite expensive. I know MSI released a pretty price competitive unit, but this for me is still the best value option. Now you can see it's not fully modular, which it loses a few points for. However, you only get the motherboard cable and then the CPU power cable pre-attached, which are two cables every PC builder is gonna need anyway. It's not like there's loads that we aren't gonna use. We're then also gonna add in our standard six plus two pin PCI power connectors and one power cable for any SATA devices, such as the RGB fans on the front of this case. Now this build doesn't need or require that 12 pin cable. However, it's still good to have. An ATX3 is about so much more than just a new GPU cable. It's more efficient, more reliable, and it manages power in a better way. So going for that more up-to-date standard is always beneficial. Get this screwed into the rear of the case and then wire up CPU power to the top left, motherboard power to the right, and GPU power, of course, to the top of the graphics card. For a full cables and wiring guide, check out our recent video in the card section now, which is also gonna cover off how to do all those front panel cables, USB headers, and any RGB devices you might have too. And with all that said and done, you can see my cable management is looking, I think, pretty good. Just taking the main cables down the middle here with the CPU power cable up to the top right hand side. I've also just gone ahead and cable tied our two eight pin GPU cables together. And you can see here the advantages of the semi-modular power supply as there isn't much hidden room to play with when it comes to cable management. All that then remains before we take a look at of course those crucial performance numbers is to plug this thing in and see if I've done a good enough job and whether it's gonna work first time. Here we go, press the power button. Oh yes, things are spinning. Do we have any RGB? Some RGB, nothing on the front though yet. The 
RGB fans are wired up. Oh, here we go. I was going to say they're wired up to the motherboard, so we'll maybe wait and see. But yeah, they've sorted themselves out. All I think this build is really lacking is a 120mm exhaust, both for airflow and also for aesthetic. So I'll chuck a cheap 120mm addressable unit in, link down below. And all that remains is to look at performance. But first, how good this thing looks when it's all powered up in a GeekoWatt montage. I'll see you in just a sec. performance and I tested this build with a wide range of titles, everything from your first person shooters to those AAA harder to run games. Now starting things off with Call of Duty's Warzone 3, here we're at 1080p high with FSR enabled and set to the quality preset, the 7700 XT pulled in a pretty impressive 188 frames per second on average. Gameplay was smooth and pretty competitive at this 1080p resolution with legs for 1440p gaming here as well. Move through into Call of Duty's Modern Warfare 3 at 1080p with the same settings and the frame rate was unsurprisingly pretty similar, this time notching up slightly to 195 FPS. Again here, more than good enough for 1080p, choosing to test at that low resolution to get the best possible frame rate in what is a competitive title. In Starfield, which is more of an RPG where resolution and visual fidelity arguably matters more, I tuned this build up to 1440p, willing to sacrifice some frame rate but get that better visual experience. Here the game pulled in 68 FPS on average on the 7700 XT, Starfield famously a terribly optimised game, so not actually a bad frame rate given the circumstance. Hogwarts Legacy at 1440p high also performed pretty well, 92 FPS this time in what is undoubtedly a better optimised title overall than Starfield, and more representative of the kind of 1440p performance this build can achieve in AAA titles. Moving through into Fortnite and turning things down to 1080p competitive settings to truly maximise the available frame rate, and again performance was good, nearly 300 FPS in fact, which is really really great from the 7700 XT. More than enough GPU, especially at 1080p. Back up to 1440p in Apex Legends and results were once again strong. 1440p high and the build pulled in 207 FPS on average. Really, really happy with that. Finally, to wrap things up, I also tested out Formula 1 2023. A personal favourite of mine is a big F1 fan. Here at the ultra high preset, FSR 2 enabled on the quality preset. Really beneficial in a simulation racing title like this one and the build did really well. 100 and 66 FPS on average, to be precise. This is a build that looks really great, provides tremendous value for money, and evidently has great gaming performance to boot. If you want to buy any of the parts of this build or check out latest pricing, links will be down in the description below. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.